was one of the uh, original oil exporting countries. They had gotten control of any productive capacity that Iran had. The Shah's trying to give pieces of the country away, basically, to cover their debts. It was the single largest source of revenue for the British Empire. And it was at that stage that the Americans stepped into the game. It was the fear of the United States that we would lose the power of the British to keep control in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. There's a strong sense that uh, the Shah is now, you know, America's man. But it was this test case for the CIA and a lot of other third world countries. Gets everybody thinking, okay, we can, we're good at this, we're good at regime change, we can do this over and over again. Khomeini and his network were really agitating. There was a sense among many of these groups, like, we didn't sign on for this. But anyone who spoke against it was basically liquidated. We supported Saddam because we saw Iran as the worst uh, of the two evils. And so I think it was sort of beware, but be prepared to take advantage of the situation as it emerges. That might trigger a, a broader confrontation. But there are really no heroes in Iran. Virtually everything that people understand about Iran is false. I mean, the entire narrative. It's rare that you see an administration come in and just yank the football back, basically. In Tehran, uh, there is a regime with its back to the wall. We could very well be in a, a very messy war. In the generations before the Second World War, Iran was subject to invasions and occupations from all sides as the traditional empires of Persia crumbled beneath a series of hapless dictators. Financial interests from more developed societies consistently overwhelmed the nation's hereditary system of monarchy, eventually culminating in the installation of a young British and American-backed ruler named Mohammad Reza Shah. To the West, he seemed like an easily controllable puppet with the right name and a military to keep him in power. But the move ignited a long-held tension that would fester for decades before exploding onto the national stage. Just 21 years old, quiet, and sickly, the newly installed Iranian Shah had been educated in Swiss boarding schools from the age of 11. He gained his first impression of the United States when he demanded that a group of American students bow to him as he passed, provoking them to beat him badly. The young prince had been sent away in part to change him from an anxious, introverted boy into a young man capable of taking over for his father, the iron-fisted dictator. Instead, the young prince had learned a love of French poetry, and made a lifelong friendship with an openly gay Swiss man. When he turned to Iran to complete his education, the naturally alienated Shah became even more insular, cloistering himself away from the traditional conservative lifestyle of the average Iranian. Uh, for the first few years of his reign, Mohammad Reza Shah is mostly disconnected from affairs. He's seen as kind of a playboy. He likes to hang out with, you know, pretty women and, you know, probably drink and, we don't, you know, don't want to cast any aspersions, but, you know, he, he'd like to have a good time. He was a rich kid. Uh, he was not prepared to be the ruler of a country like Iran that has always been sort of arbitrary, kind of authoritarian power. I mean, you can go all the way back. It's always been monarchs and uh, empires and things like that. And, and, and that's the way Reza Shah ruled it. His father was seen as a much more decisive military actor. Uh, so there's always that comparison between the two, that uh, Reza Shah was more decisive, whereas his son was indecisive, 
uh, prone to uh, inaction, even depressive moods. Most of the people of Iran were impoverished, toiling to get by and enrich their monarchy, and now their ancient hereditary throne was passing to a reclusive child of privilege who made no attempt to hide his admiration for the West. Although Iran is rich in oil, oil products are still too expensive for this family. So mother walked 15 miles to gather twigs for her fire. However, these same flaws made Mohammad Reza Shah naturally resistant to the ideas of the growing Soviet empire, and therefore necessary to the world's new high-stakes game of global positioning. Befriended by the same leaders who had just opposed his father, Mohammad Reza continued to follow the path laid out for him by more powerful, paternalistic forces. He took all the right international stances for respectability in the West, including making Iran just the second Muslim nation to recognize Israel after Ataturk's Turkey. He also stepped up his father's program of forced modernization, curtailing freedoms and pushing Iranians into unfamiliar lifestyles, all so he could propel the country further into a fundamentally atheistic global society. This culminated in 1949 with an assassination attempt by religious zealots. Fundamentalist preachers were finding incredible new energy among disaffected rural Iranians, especially the older generations, and the changing tides buoyed a number of new clerics to prominence. One particularly unlikely rising star was a dour and serious man who was only beginning to command respect among Iran's fundamentalist Shia, the Ayatollah Muhola Khomeini. Khomeini was a preacher and Islamic scholar with a unique, personal charisma. He was known to scowl in response to jokes and habitually ignored his audience while lecturing on Islamic theology. Few images exist of his early years, but even before acquiring his famously grizzled visage, he was rough and uncompromising and lived according to an incredibly regimented schedule. Even as he became steadily better known for his scholarship, he continued to live a traditional, largely reclusive life, and subsisted on a diet of mostly yogurt, garlic, and plain rice. Khomeini's growing appeal stemmed from his obvious lack of facade. When he criticized the Shah for his decadent excess, it was clear there was no hypocrisy at play. This absolutism also made his school of theology inherently political. The mullahs of Iran were generally content to rule the spiritual realm only, leaving management of the material realm to the government. But Khomeini's much stricter ideology argued that the government must enforce Islamic traditions from the top down. He came to call this idea veliat e faqi arguing that the mullahs must be given real power within the system. This extremism kept Khomeini and a few similar preachers from achieving true national power in the beginning, but over time, these teachings would resonate more and more strongly with the masses of impoverished rural Muslims whose only association with modernism was that of open, national theft. At the very same time, the new Shah's belief in Western ideals led him to relax the government's grip on the nation, including the introduction of democratically chosen national leaders with real power over the nation. Though the Shahs would continue to wield final authority in the country, their rule would now transition more toward the mold of modern British monarchs who ruled mostly through advice and veto power over the elected government. And so, driven by both anti-Western nationalism and anti-Western religious fundamentalism, the Iranian people abandoned their new Shah's vision of a modern Western allied Muslim nation just as soon as he gave them the freedom to do so. There was a desperate rush to establish an initial political status quo in the Shah's new system, which eventually boiled down to a struggle between the ancient religious faction and the newly born nationalist faction. Nationalists captured the public's attention by making British exploitation of Iran's oil into the election's central issue. Iranian politics in the late 40s and early 50s became very simplified in some ways um, over this one question of should we nationalize the oil industry. Um, up to that point, Iran had been getting what I think just about anybody could agree was kind of a raw deal. 
uh, from the UK. They've been getting pennies on the dollar, basically, for their oil. Um, and, you know, a lot of other social issues about, you know, what kind of country do we want to be? Do we want to be a constitutional monarchy? Do we want to be, you know, continue to be sort of an absolute monarchy? How do we want everything? They all got telescoped into this one question about oil nationalization. In next door Saudi Arabia, protests had just forced America to accept a 50-50 split of Aramco's profits. And soon anti-British labor riots broke out at major Iranian oil facilities. The sheer fervor of anti-British sentiment swept away the religious faction's pitch for more conservative laws, and the Shah reluctantly appointed Iran's first ever truly powerful elected national leader, Mohammad Mossadegh. This all played out against the rapidly developing backdrop of the Cold War. Iran now had a long border with the USSR, which made it quite suddenly a feature of American foreign policy, but Winston Churchill was still mainly concerned with England's shrinking Iranian oil revenues. At one point, he reminded U.S. President Harry Truman that Britain was supporting the United States and Korea, and that it therefore had the right to expect Anglo-American unity on the question of Iranian oil. The British tried hard to convince the Truman and later Eisenhower administrations that Mossadegh was leaning towards communism, even though Mossadegh was arguably just as anti-Soviet as he was anti-West. But eventually, Mossadegh finally did what many had hoped was simply a bluff and nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Abaddon, the world's largest oil refinery which British enterprise and money built, may pass out of British control if Persia carries out the vote for nationalization passed by their parliament. In the barren, arid mountains of Khuzestan, in land where no crop would grow, in land that was just so much waste to Persia, British prospectors looked for oil. And only after seven years did they find it in commercial quantities. There were no roads in the wild places where oil was found. They had to be built to carry the heavy equipment to bring the oil to the surface. 150 miles to the coast, the oil must be moved. Great pipelines were laid through the mountains, and Abaddon, an unknown desert spot, became one of the great oil ports of the world. To thousands of Persians, British enterprise brought well-paid work in good conditions. A vast modern town grew to make life pleasant. Schools for the children, classes to train Persians to do better jobs, hospitals, sanitation, food production units, all these the company provided from the oil shipped abroad. Successive governments in Persia have cooperated with the British. Let us hope that the Persians will not allow themselves to be intimidated by fanatics into a rash act which will lead to disaster for both countries. Winston Churchill was livid at the prospect of Persian control over Persian oil, but all parties agreed that the people would likely rise up if the Shah openly used his authority to overturn the decision. Instead, English ships began a devastating blockade of Iranian ports, and Mossadegh countered by telling the United States that this would give the Soviets an opening to take power there. Though he had hoped that this would lead America to try to strengthen his genuinely democratic rule, as it happened, this was precisely the wrong point for Mossadegh to make. American foreign policy was too phobic of communism and too entwined with England's economic interest to ignore the prospect of diminishing British control over the Middle East. Even as the Anglo-Iranian oil company publicly accepted its rejection, by adopting its modern name, British Petroleum, the CIA and MI6 were working to put the company back in control of Iranian oil fields. It became apparent that uh, the British were going to have to shrink their empire, and, and this then, of course, raised the question of what they were going to do uh, about protection of their oil interests in Iran. And a modus operandi was worked out between London and Washington and that was the United States would step into the British military strategic role, defending uh, these countries and their oil deposits uh, from communist penetration. So the deal was that uh, the empire would carry on, but with the United States bearing the military weight of that empire and London and Washington dividing the spoils. At this point, the CIA was just five years old having been created in 1947 from several of the wartime spy services. Its presence in Iran was about monitoring political activities, buying influence, and covertly attacking the country's communist party, called the Two Days. 
When the orders came down to remove Mossadegh from power, a project codenamed Ajax, the CIA station chief there did the only thing he knew how to do. He stirred up tensions against the atheist communists by sending bands of thugs dressed as two-day members to deface a mosque, and pressured the Shah to renounce Mossadegh with threats to abandon him if the Soviets took over Iran, which would have been a death sentence for the Shah and his family. Most importantly, the CIA bought a critical number of the voting members of the Majlis, meaning that they could legitimize any replacement for Mossadegh they chose. And so, Mossadegh countered by dissolving that parliament. This gave the Shah both the reason and the excuse he needed to move against his own prime minister, but he was suspicious of the promises of broad CIA support when he had only ever heard those promises made by a single city station chief. This is how it was decided that the BBC would chip in to prove the sincerity of the US and Britain. The CIA arranged for the BBC's regular midnight announcement, it is now midnight, to be changed to, it is now exactly midnight. This proved to the Shah that the CIA's promises were backed by genuine state power. The problem was that neither the Shah nor the nascent CIA had any experience with military overthrow nor they put in any time to rally a real coalition of support for the puppet general they'd selected to take over the government. By the time the Shah moved against Mossadegh, his prime minister was well aware of the plot, and forces loyal to the government were waiting to arrest the Shah's police. When the people heard of the Shah's attempt to rob Iran of its new national oil industry, huge groups of protesters took to the streets, led in particular by the two days, and in their rage, the mob did what would have been unthinkable just a few short years before. On August 16th, they marched on the palace and forced the Shah to flee the country. He flew to Iraq, where he told the American ambassador he expected to be in need of work, since he had very few means outside of Iran. The Shah, evidently, did not expect to return to power. Further pictures from Tehran show rioters in action as anti-royalist partisans, supporters of the aged Dr. Masadek, set about their work of destruction. The target on which much bitter feeling was focused was the statue of the Shah's father. The fall of the statue looks like being a symbol of victory for the supporters of Mossadegh. Royalists, in the most literal sense of the word, were in for a rough time. For three days, mobs of mostly two-day members ruled the streets of the capital, until Mossadegh finally stepped in. Perhaps fearing that communist fervor would overtake him as well, he asked the protesters to return home, and together with a quick police crackdown, the move brought relative peace back to the city. Tasked with removing Mossadegh from power, the CIA had succeeded only in removing the last check that had existed upon him. The Tehran CIA station chief simply asked for more funding to try again, and while he did initially receive this influx of cash, soon after, Washington thought better of the decision and followed up with orders to abandon the whole of Project Ajax as a failure. This station chief, named Kermit Roosevelt, a grandson of former President Theodore Roosevelt, saw this as surrender to the communists, and ignoring his orders, used the money he'd already received to foster chaos throughout the capital. He funded large groups of anti-government protesters of all types, both real ideological groups and paid local mobsters, busing them into Tehran to rampage through the streets and do battle with local police. Hundreds died, but as the chaos increased, it sparked exactly the cascading reaction Roosevelt had hoped for. The clergy, including Khomeini and his mentor Kashani, took advantage of this opportunity to destabilize Mossadegh, having been so recently beaten by him in the struggle for political power. Iran's historical system of monarchy had deep lines of communication to the mullahs, giving them built-in agency through their access to the ear of the Shah, and they felt threatened by the prospect of having to continually negotiate their place in society with the rest of an increasingly secular democratic culture. The return of the Shahs represented not only a redemption for their historical way of life, but also for the political status quo that had privileged them throughout that history. Uh, for a while, there we, he had some clerical allies. I mean, the, the clerical elite were not always, they weren't uniform for one thing, and they weren't always in, you know, in lockstep with the monarchy, certainly. Uh, and there were some, he did have, have some clerical support, but eventually, you know, Mossadegh's secular, Mossadegh's project was a secular kind of 
nationalist project and, and the divergence between what the clerics expected to happen and what Mossadegh wanted to happen became too great. You know, the a section of the clergy believed that it was good to have a king, that the Shah and the clergy really depended on each other. And so they weren't willing to establish a republic. That They saw that as a direct threat to their influence in society. With chaos again reigning in the streets of the capital, CIA bought forces were eventually able to surround and arrest Mossadegh, creating another riot equal to the first. The dust was still settling when Kermit Roosevelt returned to Washington a hero, and the Shah returned to the throne once again subjugated to Western power. But this time, that power was American. Former Premier Mossadegh's ruined house is a mute testimony to three days of bloody rioting culminating in a military coup from which the one-time dictator of Iran fled for his life. The Shah, who had fled to Rome, comes home, backed by General Zahedi, military strongman, who engineered his return to power. Iranian oil may again flow westward. The tribunal has been kept in an uproar, for the aged defendant has constantly challenged the authority of the court to try him and he's hurled insults at everyone, including the officer appointed to defend him. What a performance. That was the defining moment in the minds of all Iranians since that time for American-Iranian relations, namely, that the United States would, out of its own interests, violate Iranian sovereignty and place uh, on the throne the ruler of their own countries. While the initial motivation for the coup had been to restore Britain's oil revenues, once the Shah was back in power, he found that public opinion was still so against the idea of bringing England back into the oil industry that he had to keep Mossadegh's nationalization in place regardless. But if the CIA, who could now credibly threaten to kill the Shah at any time simply by withdrawing its support, it seemed like a badly needed Cold War victory. What they were afraid of was that if they went along with nationalization in Iran, they would have the same problem elsewhere. That was really the fear. And for, for the United States, it was not so much an economic problem. It was not fear of losing control over resources, because it was the British who owned those resources, basically. But it was the fear of the United States that we would lose the power of the British to keep control in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. The CIA had accomplished the seemingly magical feat of creating from nothing a revolution in favor of a hugely unpopular monarch. The Iranian coup spawned a belief in the Washington establishment that the CIA could accomplish anything, and that it especially could topple any smaller government with ease. Any kind of big win, which the CIA certainly saw this as, uh, you know, mor boosts morale and gets everybody thinking, okay, we can, we're good at this, we're good at regime change, we can do this over and over again. Uh, certainly, I think it helped kind of create that mindset or, or maybe reinforce that mindset. Uh, at the agency and, and throughout, you know, really in other parts of the, the U.S. government as well. There's no question that, that Iran was a turning point for the CIA. Uh, and that's because it was its first, you know, major sort of victory in overthrowing a regime. They were able to leak to the press their own favorable version of events. Uh, and it entered into the culture of the CIA, the internal culture of the CIA, as the way we should be doing things in the future. It encouraged the CIA to believe that it could, in fact, replicate the, 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 uh, the accomplishment of overthrowing uh, an elected regime uh, anywhere else in the world. So this was, this was the beginning of a whole history of CIA covert operations that was really new for the, for the agency. I mean, they had done covert operations during World War II and after the war, but it wasn't really a matter of overthrowing governments. This was something new. What was not appreciated was that the only reason the coup had been successful in reinstating the Shah was that it had made common cause with the country's most anti-Western powers, who evidently saw the Shah as a lesser threat to their designs than a genuinely democratic government. The CIA's Tehran station chief became the main line of communication between Iranian and American power, taking precedence even over the ambassador for official messages. For his part, the Shah well remembered the role that Iranian communists had played in his ousting, 
and provided an unwavering anti-Soviet loyalty that made him the centerpiece of American foreign policy in the Middle East. This began a period of more than 25 years for the reinstated Shah, in which he ruled with increasingly totalitarian paranoia. He became obsessed with the prospect of another challenge to his power, turning to his father's strategy of brutal military crackdown. But where the father had used violence and fear as a tool to put down specific bursts of resistance, the much flightier son used them to suppress anything he perceived as critical of his idea of an ideal Iran. Over time, his attempts to utterly eliminate anti-government sentiment required enforcement. And soon after returning to power, the Shah struck a new branch of the military called the SAVAK, or the National Organization for Security and Intelligence. CIA and Mossad agents stepped in to build it, training for the Shah an elite secret police force that was utterly loyal and willing to use any manner of torture to find and eliminate anti-government forces. Now, I was in Iran as an army advisor. How strange it all seemed at first. I had been trained for over a year and brought halfway around the world to serve for two years as a member of the Military Assistance Advisory Group in Iran. U.S. Army Special Forces mobile training teams during the course of the next two years will visit for short periods to instruct in specific subjects to help the Iranian army train a special forces group of its own. Savak succeeded in putting down organized political resistance to the Shah, but also created an enormous pool of restrained resentment among the people, a sentiment that was particularly audible in the relative safety of the mosque. Everyone knew that the Shah was only in power because of the CIA, providing the mullahs with a slow but steady stream of converts in their campaign against secular Western influence. Meanwhile, even supporters of the throne found their quality of life diminishing as the increasingly isolated Shah struggled to expand his tiny enclaves of Western society into a fully modern Muslim nation. And then they threw me to this solitary and they said, okay, now you have 24 hours to say everything yourself. Otherwise, uh, and we work on you. We know how to make you confess. And it was not just 24 hours. It was just being in the center of these torture chambers, hearing all of these cries and screams coming everywhere. I, mean, I couldn't sleep for a minute that 24 hours. Because of this, I mean, you are in the solitary and this guy is screaming, kill me, don't do that, just kill me. And this, I mean, screams all over it. Feel your ears. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the world spiraled into a new nuclear terror, as the concept of global nuclear annihilation entered the public's consciousness for the very first time. The Soviets acquired the bomb, and as worrying as that was, a new school of thought emerged to point out a potentially even more unpredictable factor. Nuclear weapons in the hands of an unstable state with multiple internal factions that could seize power at any moment. The unstable state of Iran, riven by social and religious differences that not only could topple the government, but which had, was thankfully incapable of acquiring nuclear technology on its own. And so, the Eisenhower administration decided to give it to them. In 1957, Eisenhower gave a speech that would become known as the Adams for Peace speech, in which he laid out the American plan to export nuclear technology to a wide variety of nations. The hope was to reduce the value of Soviet nuclear technology as a bargaining chip with non-nuclear nations and to reassure European allies that the U.S. was not heading toward a global war. The U.S. spent a decade building a research nuclear reactor near Tehran and supplied it with uranium and plutonium including several kilograms of highly enriched, weapons-grade material. The Shah planned more than 20 nuclear reactors across the country, declaring that oil was a resource, quote, too valuable to burn, and that his country would convert to nuclear energy as quickly as possible. Construction began on one, the Boucher nuclear reactor. The Shah energetically pursued nuclear material wherever he could, buying stakes in foreign uranium mines and securing three quarters of a billion dollars in yellow cake uranium, which allows for both energy and weapons-grade enrichment. 
He also signed the UN Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty against pursuing nuclear weapons, and by all accounts, the Shah never attempted to break this pact. To the Shah, the people of his desert kingdom seemed ungrateful, hesitant to turn away from their backwards, traditional ways of life. In 1963, his patience ran out, leading to a plan called the White Revolution. It was to be the Shah's campaign of modernization taken to the level of a war on antiquated culture. The Shah was never really popular among the vast majority of Iranians. Uh, he saw himself as a stern, modernizing ruler and as, some, as a sort of a progressive father in a way. His reforms were aimed at the country's two most powerful groups. On the one hand, he attacked the country's wealthy class of feudal landlords by forcing the sale of land to the peasantry, while on the other, he attacked the clergy by pushing for the enfranchisement of women and the creation of a universal secular education system. He tried to undermine the perception that he was westernizing the country by making the argument that a more modern Iran would be more resistant to foreign takeover. But his spending was still focused on relatively aesthetic measures of prosperity. Over many years, he raised the country's literacy rate from around 25% to over 40%, including through the use of a controversial all-female literacy corps, but physical hardship in these same areas remained rampant, even as education became more common. If you are unhappy that your country makes uh, progress, if you are unhappy that your country is saying goodbye to a feudalistic system, if you are unhappy that uh, half of the population of your country, the women are emancipated. Well, this I cannot help. It was opposed almost in lockstep by uh, any, any part of Iranian society you can identify as traditionalist. So the, the traditional aristocracy, the kind of land-owning aristocracy opposed it, and the clerics, for the most part, opposed it. The White Revolution, so named for being an attempt at a bloodless revolution, led to protests across the country. And as always, the Savak's response to this unrest was savagely violent. The land reforms did little to enrich the people in the end, and the backlash against his social reforms made religious hardliners like the Ayatollah Khomeini more popular than ever. Khomeini had already been critical of the Shah for his subservience to the United States, especially after his extension of immunity from Iranian law to all US troops in the country, but it was the white revolution that pushed Khomeini to outright denunciation. Khomeini uh, kind of bursts onto the scene uh, with his opposition to the White Revolution, and he uh, denounces the Shah, and um, you know, for for being secular and for being you know the pocket of uh, Western interests. In response, the Shah put him under house arrest, which led to violent riots, and then jailed him for six months. When Khomeini was released, the figurehead prime minister pleaded with him to publicly apologize. When the Ayatollah refused, the Prime Minister slapped him in the face and exiled him from the country. Two months later, the Prime Minister was assassinated by religious zealots. This effectively settled the domestic situation in Iran, which the United States badly needed. While coalitions of Arab countries attacked Israel every few years, the Shah's Iran was the only Middle Eastern oil power to maintain an unwavering commitment to both Israel and the West. This made America's commitment to the Shah equally ironclad, regardless of his internal policies. American foreign policy was still dominated by the global calculations of Cold War era conservatives, who could not conceive of a future for American policy without Iran as a base from which to project power into the Middle East. Meanwhile, the exiled Khomeini settled in rural Iraq with the country's southern Shia population, beginning his role as a major influencer of Iraqi politics. The Iraqis at the time were concerned with their own political revolving door, powered by revolution after bloody revolution, and tolerated Khomeini's destabilizing influence over the country's Shia majority, mostly out of fear of sparking yet another rebellion against Baghdad. Additionally, the Iraqis knew that even from a rural Iraqi village, Khomeini could still cause problems for their rival, the Shah. And this, he was more than willing to do. Khomeini began to preach that the Shah was bent on, quote, the destruction of Islam in Iran. And through its association with the Shah, the United States also came to embody the boogeyman of anti-Muslim imperialism. 
For more than 14 years, Khomeini lived in exile and preached against the Shah and the United States, patiently awaiting the chance to return and reform his homeland towards his conservative Islamic vision for its future. Well, Khomeini was one of the few Iranians uh, who opposed the Shah and lived to tell the tale. Uh, the Shah had a sort of a carrot and stick policy with him uh, and tried to sort of uh, prevent him from gaining much traction, uh, keep him under control, but not throttle him, lest there be a reaction against them. This period also served to deepen the divisions between the Shah's Shia-majority Iran and most of the rest of the Sunni-majority Muslim world. Iran looked for alliances with any regional power that would have it, but there were very few options available. Being an ally of America meant being an ally of Israel, which in turn meant being an outcast in the region, compounding the inherent isolation of a Shia nation surrounded by mostly Sunni neighbors. Just north of Israel, the tiny Shia nation of Lebanon was home to an increasing number of Palestinian refugees who pushed the country toward a civil war and began to threaten the Shah for being an American agent and traitor to Islam. Lebanon became a major training and staging area for radical Palestinian groups, while in Syria, the autocratic Hafez al-Assad became an important ally against Sunni-led Iraq. Just as the West had intended after the First World War, the Middle East was fractured along a wide variety of lines that stretched far beyond the Sunni-Shia divide. And increasingly, the Shah was thinking of the world as divided along just a single meaningful line. Iran, and the rest of the world. This mentality came out in the Shah's increasingly aggressive use of the nation's oil reserves. In 1960, he co-founded OPEC, the group of non-American oil producers, and in the early 70s, he helped lead OPEC to take steps that quadrupled the price of oil around the world. He seemed to have a genuine wish to assert Iran's independence from the West, but he remained too weak to truly break his dependence on their money and arms sales. While he drained the West of oil dollars on one side, some in the American establishment saw this as a push, since these dollars were quickly repatriated through semi-mandatory Iranian arms purchases from American aerospace contractors. The Shah was bitter about his treatment by the West, especially the vilification his Savak received in the international media, and complained about being held to a different standard on human rights than the neighboring Iraqi regime. May, may I put it this way? Many people watching you tonight, watching you talking to us now. Uh, many people in Britain, some of them cold, some of them quite poor, will be asking themselves what it is that you and certainly some of your Arab counterparts, sheikhs and rulers and governments, have against them. Are you, uh, does it in any way serve your interests well, why, to, why, to, why? To, to make a British economy suffer? Why, why against? First of all, it's not British economy. If you want to say anything, it should be the world economy. And this is not against, we're just defending our chips. Uh, because for such a long time, we have just been, uh, well, exploited, I can't say that. And uh, why don't you say that when uh, the price of uh, wheat was augmented by 300%, they had something against us, we had to buy it or soya bean, or steel products, or petrochemical products, which in some cases have augmented by 30 times. So did you have anything against us when you augmented those prices? Or what I buy from you, even weapons, the price that you are charging today is not what you were charging two months ago. It's increasing. Have you something against us? The Shah only cared about one reaction to the brutal treatment his regime gave the Iranian people, and that was the reaction of the foreign media. He was willing to undermine every power base in Iran, from the mullahs to the idle rich, in order to do what he saw as improving his country and his people. But if those same people, culturally alienated and still racked by poverty, expressed the slightest criticism of him or his government, the Savak would visit brutal retaliations. He had constructed a few fully modern urban neighborhoods in the mold of those he had seen growing up in Western boarding schools and, safe within this cloistered world of technocratic plenty, he treated any and all dissatisfaction among the people as treason. 
At the same time, the United States was undergoing a massive cultural shift. Jimmy Carter entered office with a post-Vietnam mandate to dramatically reduce the activities of the U.S. war machine, including reductions in questionable strategic alliances and arms sales to autocratic regimes like the Shah's. Iranians began to watch U.S. domestic politics, at least in the broad strokes, and many hoped Carter would end the American support for the Shah. This hope was dashed upon Carter's first visit to the country. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. Still in his first year in office, Carter had accepted the received wisdom of the establishment, which said that there was simply no other possible actor who could lead Iran. All other options to act as America's crucial Muslim partner had one deal-breaking flaw or another that made a switch impossible. In particular, America's traditional secondary allies in Saudi Arabia were becoming openly anti-American over continuing U.S. support for Israel. Under the new King Faisal, the Saudis were beginning to aggressively export their trademark sect of the Sunni religion, called Wahhabism or Salafism, and its extremism was beginning to worry observers in the West. It emphasized strict adherence to the most literal possible interpretation of the Quran, as well as brutal punishments for those who broke those rules. It also called for the complete implementation of Islamic law, or Sharia, as the only form of government essentially making it a revolutionary ideology everywhere other than Saudi Arabia itself. Even the hardliners in Iran's trademark 12-er sect seemed comparatively benign to American sensibilities, and throughout the 1970s, the single largest community of American expats was in Iran. Upon his return from the maneuvers, the Iranian monarch visits New York. With his beautiful Empress Farah, he rides up Broadway through cheers and ticker tape. An unseasonably chilly spring day is thawed by the warmth of the welcome, which the Shah says is absolutely thrilling. He tells the throng he wishes he and his wife could pay each of them back for such a thrill. Few state visitors have so captivated their hosts as this couple from the loyally friendly kingdom of Iran. The Shah was also the only figure the Americans thought could hold back the popularity of the increasingly messianic figure of Khomeini. He was publishing increasingly dangerous books about the specific bureaucratic structures of a future Islamic Republic, while his followers were beginning to think of him as almost supernatural, culminating in one widely spread rumor that his face was briefly visible in the moon. The more anti-American statements Khomeini made, the more popular he became, driving the U.S. to ignore any faults in a monarch that kept such a force from controlling Iranian oil. Even as the Shah began asserting Iranian independence from Western designs, the West continued to invest in him, believing his statements about his own increasing power in the region. Meanwhile, non-Khomeini-aligned Iranian groups like the People's Mujahideen of Iran, known by the Persian acronym MEK, continued to stage their own anti-regime and anti-American attacks inside the country. They in particular killed U.S. citizens in the country hoping to put pressure on the Shah to enforce even stricter control and further radicalize the people against himself. Does torture happen in Iran? Well, this is a question that was put to me more than once and which I don't like at all. Because it's so ridiculous that I don't have to answer that. But for the sake of uh, this interview, I will say that we don't have to torture people. This is the way that uh, unsophisticated uh, organization were doing things. We are as sophisticated as you are now. The Shah continued to retreat further into the history and material excess of the monarchy. At one point, he held a celebration for the supposed 2,500th anniversary of the Persian Empire, creating a small city at the center of the desert to host perhaps the single largest collection of monarchs and world leaders in history. Who is here today? Well, 
59 heads of state and it's quite a list either the heads themselves or their representatives the list includes one emperor eight kings five queens 15 presidents five emirs four ruling princes and dukes one royal princess two governor generals Two heirs of Baron, four junior princes, three vice presidents, including Vice President Agnew, four prime ministers, seven sheiks, and one wife of a president, and that's everything but a partridge in a pear tree. By ceaselessly burning both money and oil, the Shah was able to turn a previously barren patch of sand into an air-conditioned luxury oasis. The Shah's own capital of Tehran remained the largest city in the world without a universal sewer system, and he chose to spend anywhere from 500 to 750 million dollars in modern currency to entertain foreign guests for just three days. The celebration featured low-cut dresses, open consumption of alcohol, and, crucially, virtually no Iranian faces at all, up to and including the Shah's own Iranian ministers. The Shah believed that Iranians would be uplifted at such a grand display of their monarchy for all the world to see, galvanized by the knowledge that none could deny their right to stand shoulder to shoulder with the greatest countries in the world. Instead, the tone-deaf opulence drove the people to distraction, and from his new Iraqi home in Najaf, Khomeini condemned the grotesque display as a, quote, devil's festival. In 1978, however, the Iraqi government tired of Khomeini's troublesome influence over the Iraqi Shia, and the Ayatollah suddenly found himself homeless at the command of the country's then vice president, a budding strongman named Saddam Hussein. Khomeini would remember this name as he traveled the world, eventually settling in rural France near Paris. Though he was just an hour's drive from the city itself, he never once visited, preferring to remain cloistered with his followers in a humble, roughly Islamic way of life. And surrounded by loyal followers who worked tirelessly to produce his materials, he continued to export his dream of an explicitly politicized Islam. Then, decades of torture and killings at the hands of Sabak finally came to a head, when an arson at a popular theater burned hundreds of innocents alive. The big event, in a way, was uh when the fire took place in the cinema in Abedin. It was uh, believed by uh, Iranians there and more widely that it was Savak, uh, the Shah's intelligence agency, that had perpetrated purposefully uh, this massacre to uh, warn uh, those who were increasingly active in their opposition to the Shah to cease and desist. Khomeini began openly calling for the overthrow of the Shah on the radio and in print, calling him, quote, a Jewish agent, the American serpent whose head must be smashed with a stone. He cannot continue as Shah. To survive personally, he must flee the country. Otherwise, he will be taken by the people of Iran and punished. At this time, and it's important to note, that the Shah had hid from the Americans that he was suffering from terminal cancer and that his uh, ability to concentrate, uh, take decisions and so on was seriously compromised. But they put all their eggs in the Shah's basket and that basket was broken by this time. By 1978, the Shah was a sick man. Secure in the unqualified support of the Carter government, the Shah retaliated by having newspapers publish an article accusing Khomeini of, among other things, being a British agent, not actually being ethnically Persian, and of being a homosexual. His followers rose up, not for the first time, but on September 8, 1978, the Shah's overly confident response to their anger would break the stasis the country's conflict had endured for decades. On a day that would come to be known as Black Friday, Savak and military police opened fire on protesters, killing almost 100 of them and sparking a general strike all across the country. By the time you get to 1978, 1979, there's nobody left, really. I mean, the Shah has no base, so to, you know, anywhere, really, that, that you can find. The number killed in Tehran since the beginning of the month is probably well over 100, but people in this crowd were saying and believing 7,000 had been killed. Emotions over the dead and the rumors of dead are high. Every day here now, the demonstrations and arrests go on. 
Rumors in Tehran say people are being armed and may soon start firing back at the troops. Socialist labor leaders who had recently been denounced by the clergy as possible communist atheists were now fighting alongside the fundamentalist mullahs. And when the strike finally extended to shut down almost the entirety of Iran's oil industry, the Shah's time had finally come. Mobs once again came to arrest the Shah in his palace, but this time, rather than being foreign-backed, they were expressing genuine domestic anger. Rather than succeeding because the military was on their side, the mob was allowed to encircle the palace because they were simply too large and too violent to contain. For the second time, Mohammad Reza Shah fled the country, this time never to return. In so doing, he ended 2,500 years of virtually unbroken monarchy in the nation of Persia. Khomeini left his Parisian retreat and returned to a hero's welcome. Not a conqueror who had caused the fall of the regime, but a prophet who had predicted it. The elation of his followers overwhelmed any unease about his fundamentalist approach, making Khomeini popular even beyond his direct religious followers. Still, the revolution had been driven by labor unions, land barons, and secular cultural elites, none of whom were happy about Khomeini's return to prominence. Nevertheless, they had no choice but to accept him as the only option after such a sudden and violent removal of the status quo. And for the first time in decades, they dared to hope that Iranians might come together and focus on healing the country's wounds. As a journalist, I have willy-nilly cooperated with a system of censorship. Today, I was both delighted and at the same time ashamed by the support the people were giving the press because this very press until two, three months ago called their sons saboteurs, terrorists and foreign-led enemies of the realm. But because we went on strike in cooperation with them or in sympathy with them, they have forgiven us. They have actually forgiven our treason. If they shot me today on the street, I wouldn't be surprised. I can't forget the big headlines we used to run about. Two saboteurs being shot dead in this alley or uh, some foreign-led uh, terrorists being put on trial and all that. It was a classically Middle Eastern narrative of government collapse one that would play out a dozen more times over the next 50 years, though it would never have a bigger impact. An oppressive ruler out of step with his people maintains power through a brutal, foreign-funded police state that keeps the large diversity of opposition groups in opposition to one another. Then, after years or decades of violence, a seemingly insignificant protest breaks out and provokes an overreaction from the police or military. This creates a cycle of protest and crackdown that eventually radicalizes the situation to the point that the opposition forces have no choice but to put their differences aside. Together, they rally the people to strike and protest, eventually overthrowing the government. Typically, the loose alliance of opposition forces then disintegrates, and the region falls into a period of chaos. But in Khomeini, the Iranian regime had a figure uniquely well-positioned to move into the vacuum of power. Khomeini's protesters raged through the streets and carried him to an easy crackdown on all political dissent. These protests spawned a number of slogans, but the most lasting of them would come to be one of the central tenets of Iranian policy, religion, and daily life. Death to America.